Hello and welcome to TickMe, Time Critical Medical Education. I'm Nick Taylor and I'm an emergency physician based at the Canberra Hospital. Today's tutorial is all about anaphylaxis. So before we start talking about anaphylaxis, we're going to do a little bit of basic pathophysiology. We're going to talk about the different types of hypersensitivity reactions. So there's four main types of hypersensitivity reactions. Type 2, which includes the disease process in good pastures disease, is also known as cytotoxic hypersensitivity. The antigens which mediate this reaction are usually endogenous. The reaction time is minutes to hours, and it's primarily mediated by antibodies of IgM or IgG. Type 3 hypersensitivity, which includes SLE, is an immune complex reaction. So, usually these are made up of the IgG antibody and the antigens can be exogenous, such as bacteria, bacteria viruses or parasites, or endogenous, which is what you often see in the SLE process. Type 4 hypersensitivity includes the sort of reactions you see in TB or leprosy and also in the MAN2 reaction when you get tested for TB and it is also known as a delayed or cell mediated reaction. In general in this reaction you get granuloma formation. It's mediated primarily by T cells and can be divided into three main categories. This brings us to anaphylaxis. Now anaphylaxis is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. It is also known as immediate hypersensitivity and is IgE dependent. The primary cell in this reaction is the mast cell or basophil. The reaction is amplified however by other cells like platelets, neutrophils and eosinophils. Now although the IgE allergic anaphylaxis makes up most of the anaphylaxis, there is a non-allergic or non-IgE type. Now this non-allergic type was previously known as anaphylactoid. This has been discontinued as a term, mainly because it usually meant that people thought that an anaphylactoid reaction couldn't be serious and didn't treat it as such. Now the IgE dependent or allergic type reaction happens when an allergen binds to the FAB portion of IgE. This causes cross-linking of receptors which are present on mast cells and basophils, which then leads to activation of loads of proteins. Now the IgE independent pathway, or the non-allergic one, includes such reactions as happen in exercise, alcohol or opioid induced anaphylaxis. This reaction is still very poorly understood, but the mast cells and basophils degranulate without the IgE crosslink process happening first. In Australia, this is the breakdown of the main causes of anaphylaxis. So stings and bites make up most of them. Now in Tasmania particularly, the jack jumper ant is responsible for lots of anaphylaxis. Food is very important, particularly dairy and peanuts. We cause about one in five anaphylactic reactions, particularly with antibiotics such as the beta-lactams. Other causes which are known include inhaled or topical allergens, and then as we mentioned the exercise non-allergic anaphylaxis, but we often don't find the cause, and that's up to a quarter of the cases. Now I do want to emphasize that histamine is not just the only mediator which is released in anaphylaxis. In fact, it's just one of quite a few preformed mediators. Others include tryptase, heparin, chymase, and TNF. But during the reaction, you get this amplified vicious cycle. And so mediators are actually generated, including platelet activating factor, prostaglandins, and the leukotrienes. And then furthermore, over more hours, more mediators are released and these include the interleukins 4, 5 and 13 and then some really long ones like the granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. It's also been described that the contact system, the fibrinolytic system and also the complement cascades have been activated during anaphylaxis. Although the mast cells and basophils are really important, other cells 
like the eosinophils, platelets, and macrophages are also key in triggering the reaction. Remember, therefore, that all of these mediators and cells mean that there's a lot of redundancy and positive feedback in the system. So just fixing one element of it isn't going to do the job. So we know now how the process starts. What does all these mediators together lead to in the body? Well, the first and one of the most important processes is vasodilatation. This is mediated by nitric oxide. Now, vasodilatation, as you're aware, happens all over the body, and it also causes the gap junctions between the cells to open up, which allows fluid to leak out. So it's not surprising that fluid extravasation is one of the most important parts of anaphylaxis. Now, the fluid extravasation is absolutely profound. It's been estimated that up to 35% of your blood volume can leave your circulation in the first 10 minutes. So it's akin to someone putting a hole in your aorta. Now, this leaky fluid also is responsible for the upper airway obstruction you see as all those leaky vessels in your throat causes swelling. Smooth muscle contraction is also an incredibly important process in anaphylaxis. The smooth muscles in your lungs are probably the most important and when they suddenly contract you get profound bronchospasm in your small airways. It's almost the same as asthma. But there's also smooth muscle in other parts of your body. And if you've ever seen someone with anaphylaxis who's just had severe vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal cramps, that's because the smooth muscle in their gut is contracting hard. Some women actually come in with severe period-like pain because of the genitourinary smooth muscle contracting. It's been shown recently that anaphylaxis causes a direct myocardial depression. They think it might be because adjacent to a lot of the coronary arteries and in between myocardial fibers are a whole bunch of mast cells. So this may cause direct myocardial effects. There's also been case reports where people get ST depression in the presence of normal coronary arteries in anaphylaxis. There has been described, particularly in people who are very fluid deplete, a weird kind of paradoxical bradycardia. Now this may relate to the myocardial dysfunction that we spoke of earlier. If you did get someone with paradoxical bradycardia, you could use atropine to make the heart rate go up a bit, but as usual with atropine, it's really not very good at fixing the main problem, which is the profound hypotension. So we know what the processes are in the body which are going on. But how are we going to diagnose someone with anaphylaxis? Now, until recently, the diagnosis definition was quite complicated and unfortunately was dependent on a lot of immunological tests. I'm pleased to say that a few years ago, a consensus group got together to try and generate some definitions which are clinically based and actually quite helpful. So, you can have anaphylaxis with one of three definitions. The first is an acute onset of an illness over minutes to hours which involves the skin and mucous membranes and one of respiratory compromise or hypotension. The second way you can have a diagnosis of anaphylaxis if you have two or more of the following which occur after a likely allergen. And they are involvement of the skin or mucous membranes, respiratory compromise, hypotension, or persistent GIT symptoms. So that might be someone who said, oh look, I was having this pizza for lunch, I didn't know what was on it, and now my lips and my tongue are swollen and I just can't stop vomiting. I've got these severe tummy cramps. They would fit that classification. The third way to make the diagnosis is someone who's been exposed to a known allergen and comes in with low blood pressure. I'm allergic to nuts and now my blood pressure's 40. That's anaphylaxis as well. What about treatment?
triptase. Some people always say we should send a triptase to find out whether it's really anaphylaxis. Well firstly I'd like to say that this is a pretty useless test for emergency. Why? Because it often takes weeks to come back from an external lab. But more to the point, it's often normal in food-based anaphylaxis. A normal triptase doesn't mean you didn't have a severe allergic reaction. And a baseline high triptase is more likely to suggest a diagnosis of mastocytosis than anaphylaxis. So I generally only send a triptase if it's been advised by an immunologist that I'm referring to. So although we've got these nice case definitions for anaphylaxis, there are often some confusing patients who don't quite fit. So what is the differential diagnosis? Well, in my experience, one of the most common and important are those people with severe anxiety and having panic attacks. Classically, the anxiety associated with airway obstruction is known as globus hystericus. Now, there can be lots of other ones that are a little bit more serious, such as postprandial syndromes and, and food poisoning, which comes on all of a sudden, could look a bit like anaphylaxis. If you live in the tropics and the seafood associated scombroid poisoning is almost identical, you can get stuff like flushing syndromes, like carcinoid syndrome or menopausal syndromes, which can look quite similar. You could just come in with a severe asthma attack, which isn't anaphylaxis. You might have septic shock, which can be hard to differentiate if you didn't get a fever when the patient first presents. And then there's some other stuff, which is often quite rare, rare such as the paraneoplastic effect of some tumours. So we've talked about how anaphylaxis happens, how we might diagnose it, and now we're on to treatment. Now, to some extent, there is only one treatment for anaphylaxis. Yes, that's right, adrenaline. Now, adrenaline doesn't really need to be studied because it's providing physiologic antagonism. What do I mean by that? Well, blood vessels have alpha receptors. When they're blocked, they dilate. When your beta-1 receptors in your heart are blocked, your heart slows down and doesn't pump as hard. And when your beta-2 receptors are blocked, then you get bronchospasm. So adrenaline being an alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2 agonist antagonizes all of those effects. So, sounds like a good drug. How are we going to give it? First way we should give it in anaphylaxis is almost always intramuscularly. Be very careful not to give a subcutaneous injection because the very poor flow of blood to the subcutaneous tissues means you'll be waiting all day for it to work. The dose in general is 10 mics per kilogram up to 500 mics in an adult. So in general, someone who's sick with anaphylaxis, they'll get 500 micrograms IMI stat. Children, if you're not sure, you're generally safe above 10 kilograms to give 150 micrograms, which is the dose of the pediatric auto injector. And you can vary the dose for an adult between 250 and 500 mics depending on the severity of their response or their body weight. So you've given your IM adrenaline and it's not working. You should give another dose IM. Now if that hasn't worked then I've got a bit of a trick for giving intravenous adrenaline which I think you'll find helpful. People often struggle making up adrenaline infusions and they're worried that you have to get central axis first. Now in, a, in anaphylaxis all you need is a peripheral cannula, preferably in the cubital fossa. Grab a litre bag of saline and stick in a milligram of adrenaline. It doesn't matter which one you use, the IV or the IM, just put it in the bag. Then you start it running peripherally at one mil per kilogram per hour. And you can turn that up to 10 mils per kilogram per hour if you had to. So what you're doing is a milligram in one litre of saline running at one mil of volume per kilo per hour and titrating as necessary. It's often forgotten that a simple change in position can be incredibly important. We've already said that these people are massively fluid de deplete. So if you just lift their legs up, you'll give them up to a 500 mil fluid bolus immediately. 
The other important thing for someone who's hypotensive is to lay their head down. Someone who's got airway obstruction, however, you might have to have them partially sitting up. Fluids are obviously going to be a mainstay of anaphylaxis treatment. We've already talked about the huge volume that is going to be extravasated. So we do need to give lots of fluid. Most data suggests up to 50 mL per kilo should be given as an initial fluid bolus. Now, that's obviously going to take quite a degree of time to get in. You need a couple of large cannulae if you can. It has been described that just fluid management alone has managed anaphylaxis where hypotension is the only feature. What about steroids? People love giving steroids in allergic reactions. Are they evidence-based in anaphylaxis? Well, the short answer is probably not. Cochrane says that there really isn't any quality evidence to support their use. I would always give steroids when there's a significant asthma-like component to the presentation. And I would also give a dose of hydrocortisone or prednisolone in someone once they're largely recovered. What I wouldn't do is go hunting for my hydrocortisone when I haven't even given the adrenaline yet. So you can give steroids in anaphylaxis. We're not really sure if they're particularly helpful. Antihistamines are often thought as being the first line drug in any allergy. What I'm going to tell you today is they basically have no place in the treatment of anaphylaxis. This is confirmed by a recent Cochrane review. Talking about the pathophysiology, you'll probably come to the conclusion that an antihistamine isn't really going to fix the interleukins, prostaglandins, platelet activating factors, etc, etc, which are running around the body amplifying the process. It's important to know that big doses of antihistamines can also cause trouble. So a large dose of IV promethazine can actually cause hypotension through its central alpha blocking effects. This can actually lead to a physiological antagonism of adrenaline if you were to give enough. Antihistamines are quite good at fixing the itch or runny nose, so I would usually give these after the patient is well. What about other drugs? It's not unreasonable at all to give lots of salbutamol on someone who's got lots of bronchospasm. You can nebulize the salbutamol or you can nebulize adrenaline if you wanted to. It, there's a small amount of evidence to support the use of glucagon in the patient with refractory hypotension who might be on something like a beta blocker. And that's because glucagon works via the cyclic AMP pathway instead of the beta pathway. So probably the most exciting new development in anaphylaxis treatment is methylene blue. Methylene blue you probably know as an indicator dye or as treatment for methemoglobinemia. Now in 1997, Evora first thought that methylene blue might work for anaphylactic shock. And the reasons for methylene blue working actually make sense. Methylene blue is a guanylate cyclase inhibitor. This, th via a few extra processes, stops nitric oxide being released. And nitric oxide, as we learned, is the main end mediator for the vasodilatation. There's also some effects which may actually stop histamine release from mast cells. Now, if we're going to give methylene blue, it's given at a relatively low dose of 1.5 milligrams per kilogram over 10 minutes, and it's given really only in the people who have proven to be adrenaline non-responsive. There's been lots of recent case reports showing profound and rapid response to methylene blue treatment for refractory anaphylaxis. Side effects at this 1.5 milligram per kilogram dose are actually rare and infrequent. So we know why anaphylaxis happens. We've just diagnosed our first patient and we've given them appropriate treatment. What now? Important thing to first remember is that anyone who's had Adrenaline for anaphylaxis should be kept for four to six hours at least, and this is because a late phase response sometimes occurs. I would keep anyone overnight when their presentation is 
in the evening or you're concerned that their ability to be supervised might be somehow impaired and this might be the case with children or with adults who you're not really sure about their social circumstances. Do you need to refer everyone to an immunologist? Well the reality is that for a known allergen you probably don't. The immunologists are extremely busy and they really need their time to be kept for the people where the allergen's not that clear. There's lots and lots of difficulties with interpreting skin tests and you need your experts in that situation. One of the things you can ask your patient to do when you're concerned there might be a food allergy for example is keep a food diary. This can be incredibly important for the immunologist down the track. So if you have given anaphylaxis treatment including adrenaline you really need to discharge your patient with an adrenaline auto injector. So auto injectors of adrenaline are really the mainstay of keeping people safe out of hospital. You do need to prescribe these in anyone who's had adrenaline for their anaphylaxis unless you've got an absolutely avoidable allergen such as penicillin. They come in two types, the paediatric and adult. The paediatric is 150 micrograms and is safe for kids above 10 kilograms and the adult is 300 micrograms. It's an authority script and part of the authority is that you do have to give them information when you prescribe it. Now the information that I give is from the ASCIA website and it's fantastic. It's the Australian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy and there's a whole stack of information including your anaphylaxis action plan sheets for the patient, for their school, for their family, for their workplace. There's a whole bunch of FAQs which are in plain language so you can print them out and give them to your patients as well. The other part of the anaphylaxis treatment is risk reduction and it's really important that if someone's had a severe reaction that you try and get them to avoid the known allergen. It's sometimes really difficult in a child who's had a severe response to food and in that situation I would try and avoid the major ingredients of their last meal and particularly things like dairy or nuts. These are the people you want to try and get rapidly to an immunologist to try and work out what it is. There's also really important that you include family members and the GP in the discussion about anaphylaxis management. Everyone needs to feel that they could give the auto injector if required. You also have to make sure that the workplace and the schools are included in the loop. Alright, so this was my brief overview of anaphylaxis, pathophysiology, diagnosis, treatment and disposition. Thanks very much again to listening to TickMe and if you have any questions you can just pop them in the comment section and I'm very happy to answer them. See you next time.